is uh, some of what we will be hearing about is uh, indeed does deal with biogeography. Um, I'm Douglas Butuba from Stony Brook University in New York, um, and uh, I will be chairing the session and also giving the first paper. Um, just a couple of comments, uh, which are, um, <clears throat> first, we will try to adhere to a strict schedule. Uh, so, you know, when you've had your 15 minutes of fame, you must stop. Um, and uh, another point is, please, you in the audience, when a talk comes to an end, Please be quiet, that is, you know, we whisper or leave the room if you want to have a conversation, so that the, the other people can hear whatever give and take there is in terms of, of questions and answers. Um, and on that point, um, uh, when we do questions and answers to the fullest extent possible, let's try to use the microphone, um, because it is, it's very hard to, to hear when we have people wrestling and whispering. Um, I think that is the only point that I want to start with, and um, so the first talk is by me um, on phylogeny, biogeography, and host associations in a genus of aphids, Eurolucon. And I want to emphasize um, that uh, I am merely reporting, and so I play a, um, a rather minor role in this work. Um, I'm reporting on just a small a part of the dissertation work uh, of uh, my PhD uh, student, Amon Gill, um, who was co-advised by my colleague Josh, uh, Josh Rest, uh, who really provided the whatever advice uh, Amon got um, on bio, you know, bioinformatic and phylogenetic methods. I have to emphasize that much of what Amon has done, these methods are rather beyond my, my deep understanding. Um, so um, uh, if you have questions about the methods, I will refer you to the text that Amon has given me. Um, and so, um, um, so, um, I guess we can go to slide. Um, so here is a here's a picture of a an aphid in the genus Eurolucon, uh, which has more than 200 species, most of them distributed in North America and Eurasia, um, and the vast majority of them feed on various plants in the uh, family Asteraceae, one of the two largest families of plants which includes things like the sunflowers, um, members of the dandelion tribe, Sicorii, members of the thistle tribe, Cinarii, um, uh, members of the, the sagebrush or Artemisia tribe, the Artemisii, um, and here a uh, member of the, the uh, tribe, Asterii. And I point these out because the, because the family uh, of Asteraceae is divided into quite a large number of tribes, um, which I will be referring to. Um, and uh, many of which are utilized, not all, but many of which are utilized as hosts by these aphids. Um, now I should say that uh, all of the evolutionary work, including all the phylogenetic work that is being done or has been done on this genus, rests on the foundation that was laid by Nancy Moran and her uh, former student, Carol von Golden. Um, and they found, by, in their efforts to resolve phylogeny among, among species of Eurolucon, um, they found it very difficult to resolve uh, because of relatively low amounts of variation among species. Um, somehow we have advanced a slide that I didn't have time to get to yet. Um, and, uh, and as you will see, that remains the case. It's still very difficult to resolve the phylogeny. So any conclusions that might be drawn from this work are very tentative. And so this has to be viewed very much as one small step toward a deeper understanding of evolution in this genus. Now, Eurolucon can stand as an example of many, many different groups of herbivorous insects in that there is high diversity and high levels of host specificity, as well as specificity on a variety of plants that are related to one another, for example, mostly in the family Asteraceae. Um, and so one, so, um, so one can pose quite a number of questions about, uh, about Eurolucon as a representative of, of many groups of herbivorous insects. Um, and I will just mention a few of them. Uh, one is, do lineages switch when they switch from one host affiliation to another? Um, is it a matter of switching from one specialized habit to a different specialized habit? Or do they go through any stage of being polyphagous, of being more generalized in their feeding habits? As has been suggested, for example, for some groups of nymphalic butterflies. Um, so that's one question. Um, second, in, when, when you do see the diversification and, and, and 
switching of lineages from one group of plants to another, are there any rules, any comprehensible patterns of host switching? For example, might it be the case that in general switches occur between closely related groups of plants? Or might it be the case that uh, the switches are among chemically similar plants? The entire literature and thinking about herbivorous insect host affiliations is dominated by the notion of plant chemistry. That is, the role that chemical properties, the so-called secondary compounds of plants play in the life of herbivorous insects, which must both ad adapt to certain toxic compounds in a plant, but also use chemical compounds as the major basis on which they choose individually to eat and or lay eggs on it on a plant. Uh, using chemical cues that are both attractive and repellent. Um, and so, and that is certainly true for aphids. Um, and, um, and then thirdly, one can ask, of course, in this as in many other uh, cases, whether a, an ecological shift, let's say, from a different uh, group of plants, um, you know, accelerates di diversification, as well as the simple question whether the species richness of the clade is related to the species richness of the group of plants that that clade has, um, has invaded. Um, so there are a whole variety of questions that could be addressed uh, through a phylogenetic approach. And that, of course, is the approach that Amon took. Uh, before I say that, I just want to point out that an, a great deal of work has been done on the secondary compounds in the Asteraceae. So here you see a whole variety of different groups of chemical compounds, diterpene, sesquiterpene, lactones, and so forth, in different colors, um, and their representation among different tribes. And so you see for clearly there are differences among tribes in their chemistry. For instance, the very important sesquiterpene lactones are uh, widely distributed, very important compounds in uh, almost all the Asteraceae, except for the tribe Asterii, that includes things like Aster and Solidago, the golden rods. They're absent from that tribe. So, um, so the, the chemistry is, is, is there, and it's been well studied. Um, uh, so I will very briefly mention um, <coughs> some of the methods. So, so basically, um, Amman, this is a small part of Amman's thesis, most of which concerned one particularly interesting species of Eurolocon. But as a side project, he undertook this, uh, this analysis using sequences downloaded from GenBank from 34 species, um, basically using four loci. Um, he <clears throat> used the standard, standard ways of inferring trees, um, di uh, estimated divergence times uh, based on calibration by, by two, two uh, aphid fossils, um, uh, just as Nancy Moran has done in the past. Um, and the, uh, the, we will see, we'll see a phylogeny of Asteraceae based on work from, by Vicki Funk at the Smithsonian um, and uh, chemical data from another paper by Calabria et al. Uh, we will, he will also has used um, Dan Faith's phylo diver phylogenetic diversity of, of, of um, phylogenetic diversity to characterize the diversity of host plants that are used um, by, uh, by any group of aphids. Um, so, so very quickly, um, uh, what he's found is that the larger tribe, mac Macrocyphini, that includes your leucon, as well as the famous P. aphid, um, that tribe is monophyletic, as is the genus Eurylucon, at least based on the 34 species, a rather unfortunately small sample of the more than 200 species in that genus. Um, here, um, we, there is a time axis along the bottom, and this is a quick sketch of the uh, inference of the, the biogeographic history, in which it appears as if some basal lineages are in North America. The suggestion is that that might, North America may have been the ancestral home of the genus Eurylucon, but with a, um, but with a switch here, uh, an expansion into Eurasia. And so you have a whole, a large number of species that are found in Eurasia. And then a secondary reinvasion of, of an of Eurasian lineage back into North America um, just about oh, less than four million years ago, um, giving rise to another radiation of species. Um, so it's a rather complex um, uh, biogeographic history. Uh, it would be nice, of course, to have many, many more species of Eurylucon uh, you know, included here to have some sense of what the history has been of the rate of diversification in these 
about these regions, but I don't think we can say very much about that yet. Um, now, this here among has, uh, has collapsed um, insufficiently resolved nodes into polytomies so that we don't pretend to more knowledge than we actually have, or at least not much more knowledge than we actually have. Um, and here each species is connected to its host plants, uh, which are shown here as a phylogeny of the tribes of the Ufo of the Asteraceae that are used as hosts by these aphids. It should be said that a number of other Asteraceous tribes would be interpolated into this phylogeny at various points, tribes that are not used by any of the species in this study, uh, of aphids in this study. And what you can see is um, that, well, a couple of things. First of all, there are a few species, such as, um, such as this, uh, this one, uh, which feed, which are polyphagous. They feed on, on plants in, in two or more tribes. But the great majority feed on plants in only one tribe. Secondly, there is no, hardly any hint of congruence at all between the phylogeny of the aphids and the phylogeny of tribes of Asteraceae. Um, and this is typical of most cases of herbivorous insects that have been studied. By and large, you're looking at radiations of an insect group that long post-date the diversification of the plants in which that, 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 that group feeds. Um, and there, is, there certainly has not been any co- a co-diversification or co-speciation, um, at least at the at the higher taxonomic levels. Um, so, so this is a phylogeny of the plants from Vicky Funk based on DNA sequence data. Um, that's what we're looking at here. And the next slide shows a phylogenetic analysis by a group of authors using secondary compounds as characters. So in some sense, this might even be viewed more as a kind of phonetic characterization of chemical similarity among different, among different um, host tribes. Um, and of course, we have the same linkages again. The structure of this tree is somewhat different from what we might suppose is a, 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 a better approximation of the phylogeny of the plants based on DNA sequences. Um, and one <coughs> thing that, that Aman has done um, here is to characterize the phylogenetic uh, diversity index of these aphids based on the DNA sequences of their host plants compared to the phylogenetic basity, uh, diversity if you pretended that the chemistry represented the phylogeny of host plants. And what you see is that the, the, the phylogenetic diversity uh, index is somewhat lower um, for the relationship between aphids and the diversity, the chemical diversity of the host plants that they're using, suggesting that there is a greater tendency for aphids to be feeding on chemically similar plants than on related plants. So to the extent you can separate chemical similarity from phylogenetic relatedness, it appears as if the chemical similarity of plants has an edge. Um, uh, okay. And here he's done the same thing, um, picking out those particular species of Eurolucon are generalists, that is to say, which a species feeds on two or more tribes of Asteraceae. And here again, he looks for those species um, uh, to see what is the phylogenetic diversity of their hosts, calculated either uh, on the basis of their phylogenetic um, relatedness or on the basis of their chemical relatedness or chemical similarity. And again, the PD value is lower based on um, the chemical similarity implying that, they, that these aphids are feeding on a chemically more homogeneous set of plants than on a phylogenetically homogeneous set of plants. So again, it's a, 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 a and in this case, it's, there's you know, some marginal statistical significance, suggesting then that the chemical similarity of plants rather than, their, than the phylogenetic relatedness of plants is more of a guide to the likelihood of host shifts. Um, this, 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 this mirrors um, uh, uh, work done by Hudi Becerra many years ago on a genus of Chrysanella beetles uh, feeding on trees in which she came to the same conclusion that the chemical similarity of trees was a better indicator of host shifts um, or the probability of host shifts than the uh, relatedness of trees. Um, and I think that that brings me to the end. Conclusions, it looks as if the genus is monophyletic. Uh, there's been a recent radiation in North America, um, uh, and hence the phylogeny is poorly resolved. Um, there's no evidence of a generalist-specialist oscillation in the transition from one uh, uh, um, tribe.
tribe to another. So it looks as if, uh, by and large, a host tribe use evolves by switching between specialized habits. Um, uh, there is a suggestion, which I didn't point out, that most species specialize on those particular tribes of Asteraceae that are most diverse in North America on the one hand versus Eurasia on the other hand. And I didn't point that out, but it is, if it's not just a sampling uh, issue, there is the possibility that, that um, there really is greater diversification on plant groups that are more diverse uh, in a given region. Um, and then finally, the shifts between uh, tribes are frequent. They are not clearly related to plant phylogeny, but do appear to be somewhat related to chemical similarity of plants. And that is the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. And there is, I'm sorry, no time for questions. Thank you.